Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. We are looking at the fourth chapter of Ephesians. We are studying what it means to walk worthy. Now, as we've been saying, our walk is our conduct. It's our lifestyle. It's how we live our life day to day. And we've seen in this chapter that believers are called to live up to who they are in Christ. Our life is to match our position in Christ. We looked two weeks ago at uh, verses 17 through 19, which tell us how a believer should not walk. He says we are not to walk as Gentiles, which there is using that in the sense of unbelievers, and the futility of their mind. That's how we're not to walk. And then Paul teaches in verses 20 through 24, he says that they had been taught that they have put off the old man, and they put on the new man. So let's look at verse 22 again, because the translations are really misleading here, and we need to understand this. In verse 22, he says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Now, the lexical verbs of laying aside here and putting on in verse 24 emphasize accomplished events rather than a process. All right, very important that we understand that. Paul is not telling them to do something, he's not saying put aside that old man. He's saying the old man has been laid aside and therefore you are not to live like unbelievers. He is talking about their position in Christ. And this fits very well with the context here. In verses 22 through 24, Paul reminds them of what it was that they were taught, which was that they were in Christ. They have laid aside the old man. They have put on the new. Now in verses 25 through 32, he's going to give some very practical applications of how the new person in Christ is to live day by day. So beginning with verse 25 and you know maybe going all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul gets specific. He names a bunch of specific sins that have been characterized by the old man that we are to do away with because we have put off that old man. And while there are so, some exceptions to this, his usual method is to state the sinful behavior that we're to put off the godly behavior we're to put on, and then the motive or the reason for this positive behavior. Let's uh, look at verse 25. This is about as far as we're going to get today. <laughs> uh, it's just, this is some very, very practical, down-to-earth stuff, and uh, we don't want to miss anything here. He says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Therefore, takes us back to the preceding context. Because we must no longer live like the Gentiles, because we have received the teaching of Christ, because we understand now that we have put off the old man and put on the new man, therefore, he says, lay aside falsehood. Now, the words here, laying aside, are from the Greek word apotithemi. And it means to put away. Literally or figuratively, it means to cast off, to lay aside, put off. It's like the idea of putting off your clothes. And it's even used that way in Acts. If, uh, in Acts 7, he says, And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Uh, the metaphor here is one of taking off clothes. Apotithemi, in our text in Ephesians, is in the aorist middle, and is better rendered having laid aside falsehood. Now that's really important because the translations don't seem to pick this up at all, and, and very, very few commentators even mention this, but it's important. He's not telling them, lay this aside. He's saying you have laid aside. Now the English majority text version correctly renders it this way, therefore having put off falsehood. They've done it. This shows it's a completed action. It took place at conversion. When they put off the old man, they literally put off falsehood. 
But the Apostolic Bible Polyglot does an even better job and translates it this way. Therefore, having put aside the lie. Having put aside the lie. And that's literally what this text is saying. Now, in the New American Standard, use the word falsehood here. The word falsehood is from pseudos. But literally, like I said, what he's saying is put off the lie. Now, Paul uses the same exact expression in Romans 1.25. For they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Now, the Greek text here, it says the lie. They exchanged the truth. So Paul, he uses this same expression in Ephesians 4.25. But here in Romans, he's identifying it with idolatry. He says, the lie, he says, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So he's, Romans is talking about idolatry. That's what the lie was. So Paul may be using falsehood or the lie here in the sense of that which is opposed to the truth of the Bible. He's just said that the new man has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Now he says, having put away the lie... And it's possible that what he means is everything that is contrary to the truth of the Word of God. All the philosophy that is contrary to the Holy Scriptures might be called the lie. It's everything you held to, everything you believed prior to coming to Christ. Having laid aside the lie, he says, speak truth. The lie. I think it really speaks to anything that might be spoken plainly or insinuated by our words or actions that's known to not be true. It's when we purposely mislead someone away from the truth. It's the lie. He goes on to say, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Now the word speak here is a present active imperative indicating that they are to make a habit of doing this. It's just continually, constantly be speaking the truth with each other. Now let me ask you something, believers. Do Christians need to be told to tell the truth? You laugh. Why, why is that? I mean, why do we need to be told this? I mean, as Christians, don't we automatically live right after we're saved? I mean, yeah, we, you know, so many teach we have a new nature and we're just new people and we just automatically do everything right. If practical righteousness was automatic, like so many teach, Paul wouldn't need to be telling us to speak the truth. All right, But because practical righteousness is not automatic, the New Testament is loaded with commands for believers, instructing them, guiding them on how they're to live right now. Now, did you notice that in the New American, this is in caps? Why is that? It's a quotation, right? From the Tanakh. Where's this, where's he quoting from? Anybody know? Zechariah. Okay, so let's go to Zechariah 8.16. He says, These are the things which you should do. Speak the truth with one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. Now, in Paul's day, the rabbinic teachers used a technique which is today called remez. Now, they didn't call it that back in the day but that's a name that's been put on it now, remez or hint. And this is very important when you're reading the Scriptures. What these rabbis would do, what the teachers would do, they would use a part of Scripture, just like Paul's doing right here in Ephesians. He pulls a piece out of Zechariah here, and he quotes it. Now when they do this, they are assuming, they wouldn't do this today, but they're assuming that their audience knows the context. All right, see, the, the people they're teaching, the people they're talking to, knew the Bible. They, they spent great lengths memorizing. Every Hebrew child, by the time he was 12, had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Most Christians, they can't even read Leviticus, let alone having the first five books of the Bible memorized. So, so they would take just a piece of Scripture, and they would quote it, understanding that the people they're talking to knew the whole context. So they'd be familiar with, you know, because it's not, he's not just pulling a thing out. He's talking about this in context. Anybody have a clue what the context is of Zechariah 8? 
It's really cool because when you understand the context, it makes so much more sense. And when you're reading and you see something like this in all caps, go back and read the context to figure out what's going on. Because this verse follows immediately upon promises regarding the new Jerusalem. Let's go back to uh, verse 7 and 8. And you just need to read the whole chapter here. But it says, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. Now, Zechariah is written right after the return of the Babylonian captivity. So they're back in Jerusalem now, but <laughs> this prophecy is of the new Jerusalem. He's going to bring them back. He says, I will bring them back and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people. Does that sound familiar? And I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. This is speaking of the gathering of the remnant. This is the promise of the new Jerusalem. Now here's what we have to understand. The new Jerusalem is synonymous with the new covenant. And that is so easy to prove. Now, most people today are going to say, no, the new Jerusalem, we're waiting for that. It's going to come down out of the sky. This literal you know, building is going to float down out of the sky and land on the earth, which would literally knock the earth out of its orbit. But... Uh, <clears throat> Since Earth's not in an orbit, it'd probably be okay. <laughs> okay, I, I need to move on there. But let me show you a text that, that demonstrates this. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants. All right? So you get the context. He's talking about two different covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai. We know that what that is. That's the old covenant. Bearing children who are slaves. So he's saying those under that old covenant, they are slaves. They're children of Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. We know what came from Mount Sinai, the law. And correspond, he says, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. That's the Jerusalem that was there when Paul was speaking, the literal physical building. And then he says, for she is in slavery with her children. That's bondage. But he says, the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. So he's got two covenants. He's got two Jerusalems. And he's comparing the old covenant with the present physical Jerusalem and the new covenant with the heavenly Jerusalem that's going to come down. So what Zechariah says is, listen, he is, Paul is connecting what is happening. He's connecting this truth speaking to these people in Ephesus with what's going on in the new Jerusalem. So the new Jerusalem, it's the new heaven, it's the new earth, which is the new covenant. And what Zechariah does is say, your conduct is to be like this in the new Jerusalem. He says, speak truth one to another. Now this is exactly what Paul tells the Ephesians to do. And why does he do that? Because listen, because these Ephesians are in the new Jerusalem. And that's what he's telling them. Listen, the new Jerusalem has come. This is what Yahweh prophesied what would happen. This is what he said the conduct was going to be in that new Jerusalem. So by quoting that, he's telling them, you're in that new Jerusalem. You're there now. Believers, he say, you are inhabiting Zion, which is called the city of truth, because of the indwelling presence of Yahweh. Zechariah 8.3 says, Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. There's six references to truth in this prophecy of Zechariah. Because this is, the, this is the character, this is the nature of the new Jerusalem, of the city of God, of the dwelling place of God. And the people who dwell there are people of truth. Very important, that context. It's kind of neat that you know, he's connecting them with a prophecy that most people are looking forward to. And if you're a futurist, I guess you can ignore this call to speak the truth because that happens in the New Jerusalem. And if you're not there yet, I guess you don't have to speak truth. Well, Paul gives the reason that we're to speak the truth to our neighbors. He says, for we're members one of another. Now, Although we need to follow biblical principles of ethics at all times and toward everyone, Paul's focusing the behavior here on the members of the body of Christ. To each other. That's how we are to treat one another. 
John Chrysostom, the 4th century preacher, wrote this. If the eye sees a serpent, does it deceive the foot? If a tongue tastes bitter, does it deceive the stomach? Get what he's saying there? Your body works together to protect itself. If the eye sees a serpent, does it say, hey, there's a serpent, go ahead and stick your foot out and let it bite? No, it says, foot, get out of the way, body, move. You protect the members of your body because you're a body. The health of the physical body depends on truthful communication between members of the nervous system. If you put your hand on a hot stove and those nerves don't come back and tell you that thing's hot, you better get your hand off there. Your hand's going to get burned, and then it's going to get infected, and then guess what? That infection can spread to the whole body, and the whole body is taken down. A person with leprosy lacks communication between the nerves and the brain, and that's why you see so many lepers, they just have nubs. They actually wear their fingers off, wear their hands off, because they don't feel it. They don't know the problem's there. They can destroy parts of their own body without even knowing it. So what this means is that if you lie to your spouse, if you lie to another member of the body of Christ, you are injuring yourself. And worse, you're injuring the body of Christ in that lie. Believers, as Yahweh's children, we are to only and always speak the truth. Truth is an accurate representation of the facts. We're telling exactly what it is. Especially, truth is conformity to Yahweh's standards as revealed in the Word of God. In John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Yahweh is the truth, and He always speaks the truth, and He calls on His children to do the same. You know, I think one of the great moral issues that we struggle with today is telling the truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Lying is probably one of the most prevalent sins that we face on a daily basis. It's basically the default practice of most. Government officials do it. Yeah, I know you can't believe that. Teachers do it. Parents do it. Children do it. We have come to expect it. We really have. In the book, The Day That America Told the Truth, it states that 91% of us lie regularly. That's a pretty high percentage. Of the people interviewed, 92% said the main reason for their lying was to save face. And 98% said the reason they told lies was so as not to offend people. I love that because they're saying, I'm lying, but I'm just doing it to look out for others. I don't want to offend anyone, so I'm just going to lie about things. Another survey of 20,000 middle and high schoolers indicated that 92% admitted to lying to their parents in the previous year. It's, am it's amazing. These statistics really go along with one another. It said 73% said that they told lies weekly. And despite these admissions, 91% of all respondents said they were satisfied with their own ethics and character. So they say, yes, I lie weekly, but I'm happy with my character. I'm happy with my ethics. Because that's what our society has come to right now. And if you think, well, yeah, that's just the unsaved, right? Well, George Gallup says this, church attendance makes little difference in people's ethical views and behavior with respect to lying, cheating, pilferage, and not reporting theft. I guess church attendance wouldn't make any difference. You know, it's not about church attendance, you know? It's about, do you know Christ? There's a lot of people who attend church. I'm sure they don't have a clue of who Christ is. So you have to ask this question. Does everybody lie? Does everybody lie? Well, you know what? If you do a Bible study on lying, and you begin in Genesis, and you just go through, how far do you get before you come to the first lie? Chapter what? Chapter 3, right? Who lies in chapter 3? Satan says, hey, you won't die. It's okay. God, you know, he's a little confused maybe. And then Cain lies to Yahweh after murdering Abel in chapter 4. Then Abraham lies, claiming Sarah's his sister instead of his wife. Then Sarah lies to the three angelic visitors in 18, and she lies to the king of Gerar. Isaac lied by denying... Rebecca was his wife in 26. 
Rebekah and Isaac lied in their conspiracy to default Esau of his birthright in chapter 27. Jacob's sons lie to him about Joseph's death. Hey, they sell him into slavery, but they come back and said, look, we found, is this robe your son's? You know, it's got blood. We, <laughs> they didn't have DNA testing there. They couldn't tell it was a goat's blood. They, I mean, they deceived their father. Your son's dead. Man, it's really sad. Sorry about that. That doesn't even get us out of Genesis, okay? And you go on, I mean, on and on. Even Peter, the supposed first pope, Lied. Matthew 26, 69 says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Yeshua of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you imagine? This guy has spent three and a half years with Yeshua. He's seen him walk on water. He's walked on water. He's seen all kinds of miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, and he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know that guy. So it's not unnecessary for Paul to tell Christians, speak the truth to each other. Speak the truth. And if you look at our society, it sure seems like everybody lies. I mean, the politicians, the salesmen, the, the doctors, the boss, everybody Everybody seems to misrepresent the truth or exaggerate the truth in one way or another. It's just the way our society seems to function today. And we're part of this society, and so we take part in the misrepresentation ourselves. You know, your son's got to go to court. So you call his boss and say, my son's really sick today. He won't be able to come into work. Or you know full well you're doing 72 and a 55, but you insist you were only going 60, which is kind of dumb today because they got you on radar, you know? And when a friend wants to know what you think of her new dress, you don't want to offend, right? So we flatter and we tell her, man, that outfit looks absolutely stunning on you. Lying is part of our society. And all too often we get caught up in the practice ourselves. Probably many of us feel pressure from time to time to distort the truth just in order to survive in the culture we're in. But though our society gives ample place to the lie, the Lord does not. The Bible teaches us that telling the truth is a necessity for survival in life as we know it. You know, chaos always results when your lies replace the truth. Can you imagine living in an environment where there's no truth? We're almost there. Right? No truth on labels. <laughs> I think we're just about there now, right? I read labels very carefully, but I'm like, is there a point to this? You know, all natural. No, it's not. But that's a buzzword that they catch, you know, because you know, they want, people want natural stuff, so they just throw it on the label and they get away with it. People lie on contract, guarantees, promises. It's crazy. Advertising on TV is all geared to lie to you. I saw a Pepsi ad the other day. I was like, you kidding me? This will make you happy. If you drink Pepsi, you will be a happy person. That's ridiculous. I mean, how dumb are we? The advertisements we watch on TV are just loaded with lies. And our government lies to us. I know, that's really hard to believe, but... Yeah. (laughs) This is a problem. Because without truth relationships dissolve. Because there's no trust holding people together and you end up with chaos. How vital for us as believers of Yeshua to spend a few moments just focusing on how important it is to be truth tellers. Do you understand that Yahweh hates lying? He commands us to deal truthfully with one another. Look at Proverbs 6, 16-19. There are six things which Yahweh hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. Okay, that's an abomination to God. He hates a lying tongue. He hasn't changed. He's the Lord. He changes not. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. Let's back up there. Hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. We got a problem with that in our society? You think that abortion would fall into that category? Hands that shed it in some blood. It's an abomination to the Lord. 
A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utter lies, and one who spreads strife among the brethren. Do you notice that of the seven abominations, two of them deal with lying? I mean, he picks out seven things he hates and he uses lying twice. Why? He is the God of truth. Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to Yahweh, but those who deal faithfully are His delight. So do we want to be an abomination to the Lord or do we want to be His delight? Proverbs 20, 17. Bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man. You, know, you get bread, you can taste that nice white soft bread right out of the oven in your mouth, but afterwards his mouth will be filled with gravel. Now that's not a good picture. <laughs> but that's the picture, the word picture he's painting here. Proverbs 21, 6. The acquisition of treasure by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor, the pursuit of death. The ninth commandment is clear on its intent. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Yahweh doesn't want us lying to one another about one another. Leviticus 19 repeats Yahweh's emphatic instruction to Israel. He says, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. We're not to do that. In Psalm 15, he asked the question, O Yahweh, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And he gives this answer, He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. In a word, lying was to be rooted out of Yahweh's people Israel. And Yahweh, who never changes, hates lying equally as much today. Look at Revelation 21. He who overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's interesting, he gets the liars and he says, all the liars go to the lake that burns with fire. You know, do you see how he lumps liars in here with idolaters and murderers? That's kind of serious. Revelation 22, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat, the right to the tree of life, and may enter the gates into the holy city. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the new covenant. Outside, outside the city are dogs and sorcerers and immoral persons and murderers and idolaters. There you got the murderers and idolaters again. And everyone who loves and practices lying. So outside of the new Jerusalem, which represents the new covenant, everyone who loves and practices lying is put out. Now, this is not saying that everyone who lies is kicked out of the New Jerusalem and thrown in the lake of fire. All right? That's not what he's saying here. It is saying that lying is characteristic of the unsaved. It's characteristic of those who are not part of the city, those who are in the lake of fire. So as believers, we are not to be characterized by that. This is very similar to what Paul is saying in Ephesians. We have put off falsehood, therefore we are to always be telling the truth. I think these scriptures should make it clear that Yahweh hates lying and commands us to tell the truth. What was the first sin that was publicly judged in the New Covenant Church? It was lying. It was Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? See, the problem wasn't that they kept back their, some of their money. They could have kept it all if they wanted to. The problem was Barnabas had just given his money, and they said, wow, look at people like what Barnabas did. Let's us sell our land and pretend we gave it all. We'll keep some of it. We'll just, you know. They wanted attention, so they lie. And he says, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. Can you imagine? Oh, if the Lord still did that. Yeah. Huh? There'd be less lying. There'd be less people. <laughs> There'd be a lot less people. There would definitely be less lying, but there would be a lot less people. <laughs> and can you imagine how the church responded to that? You know, that not often you see sin judged on a basis like that. 
Now, most of us would agree that lying is not a good thing. However, we have a problem because so, to some degree, most of us lie. Telling the truth is difficult, particularly as we live in a society that increasingly distorts the value of telling the truth. Lying is so much part and parcel of today's society that many Christians feel the need to lie from time to time just to get, they're going to survive in the society. So how do we apply the norm of Scripture to our culture today that is so permeated with lying? Well, to answer that question, I think we can look to Paul and a letter he wrote to Titus. Titus 1.5, he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. We learn from this passage that Paul had left Titus on the Isle of Crete to appoint church leaders, elders, to, to get the local church in place, to set it up. And this wasn't an easy task for Titus, and so Paul writes him this letter to encourage him to help him out. And in this letter, Paul interacts with the circumstances as they were on that island. And he says this in verse 10, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So here are people who have heard the gospel, but now they're communicating in a way that basically misrepresents the gospel. And as a result, verse 11, he says, whole households are subverted. In that context, Paul says, it is the way Cretans are. He says, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So Paul quotes one of their own poets, to confirm that Cretans are always liars. Then he adds, this testimony is true in verse 13. So here there was a culture very similar to our own. But now notice, Paul doesn't tell Titus, listen, that's just how the culture is. Okay, you can't expect them to act any differently. That's all they know, just, you know, kind of take it easy on them. But that's not what he says. He says, this testimony is true for this reason. Reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. He doesn't tolerate lying among the people of Crete, even though they've been taught that from their youth. He is coming down very hard. Reprove them severely. Now the question is this, why does Paul be so rough on them? Why doesn't he tolerate it? Shouldn't he not recognize the, the circumstances they're in and just kind of give them a little slack? Well, Paul tells us why he doesn't tolerate it in verse 1. He says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Yeshua the Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Paul's basically saying, listen, we are serving the God of truth. We are serving the God who cannot lie, and we are misrepresenting Him when we lie. We serve a God who does. Aren't you glad He doesn't lie? Can you imagine if, if, if He was like us? We read a promise and we're like, well, we're not really sure if that means what it says because it doesn't always tell the truth. No, He does. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change His mind. For He is not a man that He should change His mind. Hebrews 6, 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We, who have taken refuge, would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Yahweh is a God of truth. Why did Yahweh want them to know that He cannot lie? In order that they would have strong encouragement, He says. He wanted them to be sure that His promises are true. That you can be encouraged by that. God doesn't lie, so take courage in the promises that He has given you. And if Yahweh doesn't lie, but is the God of truth, Isaiah 65, 16, what place is there for lying among His people? He says to be put away, we're to speak truth with each other. You know, another reason to be truth tellers is that as Christians, we're called to imitate Yeshua. We'll get to that in a little bit in Ephesians, but in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. So what's he saying? Follow Christ. I'm following Christ, so you can follow my example, but that's what you're doing. If you follow me, you're following Christ because he's imitating Christ. 
Christians are not to lie because we are to be imitating Yeshua. I wonder if we fully realize how a skeptical public judges the merits of Christianity by observing Christians' behavior. Yeshua identified Himself as truth by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Since Yeshua is truth, His cause is injured by even one lie. And Christianity is made contemptible in the eyes of the people to whom we lie. Because he not only people not when we lie, they don't only see us, they see the whole cause for which you stand, and they write it off as that's crazy. I think if we all took a tally of how often we stretch the truth, it would be totally humiliating to learn how often we can compromise being totally honest. Because of the reputation of Yeshua is at stake in our behavior. God is calling us to be proactive in carefully scrutinizing our habits of exaggerating, telling white lies, separating our business ethics from our personal ethics. The secular world loves nothing better than to catch a Christian in a lie, followed by the usual litany, and you say you're a Christian? If that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. And sadly, that's the thing we put across. When we lie, because they're just looking for something to accuse believers of. Well, we mentioned white lies. What are white lies? They're called that because they're considered harmless. See, a white lie is a lie that doesn't hurt anybody. All right? But when you see this in light of Scripture, you see that a white lie is still a lie. All right? White lies usually occur in circumstances where you're asked to give your opinion about someone's dress or personality, and we, we feel negative, and you don't want to really say what you feel for fear of hurting their feelings, unless you're Garrett, so we lie, <laughs> and we say nice things, the pleasant thing, so their feelings don't get hurt. You know, we think, I've saved them from hurt, therefore no harm was done by lying. But what is happening in those situations that we decide when's a good time to lie and when is not, it's basically situational ethics. Well, I didn't say what the truth was because I just didn't want to hurt them. Many years ago, a long time back, when I was a lot younger and a whole lot dumber, if you can believe that, I was in a meeting with a couple. They asked me to meet with them. I believe we were meeting in a restaurant. And the woman said to me, what do you think of me? I don't think that's a question that someone should ask somebody unless you maybe know what the answer is going to be favorably in your case, you know. What I could have said, what I should have said was, I think that you're a person who tries too hard to please people. And because you try to look good in everybody's eyes, you end up seeming somewhat artificial. Maybe that's what I should have said or could have said. What I said was, I think you're a phony and a hypocrite. By the look on her face after that, I don't think she liked that. Matter of fact, she looked direct at her husband like, are you going to hit him? Are you going to beat him up? Or would do something, you know? And that was kind of the end of that meeting. But, I mean, why would you ask somebody that? If you don't want the answer, don't ask the question. I mean, I was put on the spot. I, I wasn't sure what, but, you know, like I said, I was a lot dumber, and I just blurted out what I thought of her. <laughs> I figured she wanted to know, all right? I believe that we can speak the truth, though, without being cruel. We are to be truthful because Yeshua, who we are to imitate, is always truthful. But let's not to forget we can do that in a way that really maybe doesn't hurt people. But I think we need to be more honest with people. You know, some people walk around and you look at them and you're like, did they have a mirror at their house? Did they literally leave the house looking like that? Because everyone says, oh, you look great. Oh, you look fine. No one tells the truth, you know? Someone says, mm, I mean, you might want to go back and rethink that whole thing there. All right? So one reason to be a truth teller is to reveal to the world that following Yeshua creates a new breed of person committed to being truth tellers even amidst a crooked, perverse environment. I think another reason that we're to be truth tellers is that telling lies has really bad consequences. Look at Psalm 101.7. He, he who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Taking detours from truth destroys relationships. 
At the national level, Gallup polls reveal that widespread public distrust of politicians and media has resulted from so many lies being exposed. You think cynicism, which I have, has become a national disease. It's come to the point, at least for me anyway, I don't believe anything I hear from the news or from politicians. I, I don't care who, well, this is a good guy, this guy's saw. Well, if his lips are moving, I think he's lying, unless I find out for some reason otherwise. Because it's just, I mean, you know, the news, you're watching, this happened over here, and I, I take that with a grain of salt because I'm like, I haven't seen that, I don't really know that's going on. You know, and I know that we are lied to about things, so I'm very skeptical of what I hear that I can't verify. Consequences become even more painful at the personal relational level. Can you articulate the pain when a person we trust lies to us? Relationships are devastated. Isolation, anger, and suspicion rush in to fill the vacuum. How can you trust someone who lies to you? I, Kathy and I tried to stress this with our children over and over when they were young. If you lie to us, we can't trust you. Therefore, we can't believe anything you say. Therefore, you have no freedom. If we trust you, you can do certain things because we know we can trust you. We can ask you and you'll tell the truth. But I don't know about your kids, but my kids went to lying school when they were young. I don't know when they went, but I mean, when they're very little, they just learned to lie so quickly about so many things. And I'm like, scratching my head, how'd they learn that? How'd they learn that? We can't trust people that lie to us. How can you have a meaningful relationship with someone that you can't trust? You don't know what they're saying. You're like, well, I know you lie, so are you lying now or are you not lying now? You know, I've been lied to so often and by so many people that when someone tells me something, that if I don't know that person's character, I just assume they're lying. Unless, you know, I mean, if they're, we're outside and they're saying, it, the sky is really blue today, I'll believe that. Okay, but something I can't verify, I'm like, wait a second, I don't know you, I don't know why should I believe anything you say. Because people lie, especially when it benefits them in some way. Focusing on the personal consequences of habitual lying, we find increasing devastation. A liar lives under the pressure of always trying to remember every lie he told. Truth becomes relative becomes what you want it to be, and lying becomes a kind of a personal prison for that person. Needless to say, the Bible urges us to tell the truth because of the dire consequences of telling lies. It hurts the body of Christ. Cal Thomas, I think, was right when he wrote regarding God's law. In reality, these moral laws have all the certainty of physical laws. When they are violated, a society always discovers the revenge of the offended absolutes. Now you might be thinking, how in the world can we survive if we always tell the truth in today's climate? We will not quickly find ourselves out of a job or poverty stricken or whatever else if we don't lie to our boss. I mean, sometimes our boss tells us to lie. Aren't we supposed, you know, if we don't do it, well, are we going to be in trouble? I mean... If I really tell my dad where I was, I'm not going to be able to go out of the house anymore. If I really answer the teacher's question, I'm going to flunk this test. Why do people lie? Well, I think the biggest reason is to escape unwanted consequences. We're in a situation and we're like, hmm, I'm not going to like the result of this if the truth comes out, so I'm going to try to shade it. Basically, then, it's self-preservation, right? It's all about us, making ourselves look good. See, I think it's a fact that our finite minds drive us to the conclusion that we just won't survive in business or in life if we just speak the truth all the time. But that's because our minds do not give Yahweh the place He needs in our thinking. We just don't trust Him. I was involved in the car business for quite a while, and people would always say, you're a preacher and a car dealer? How does that work? I said, it can, you can tell the truth if you have a decent thing to sell. And if you don't, if you just tell them what you got, they appreciate that. You know, that's all you got to do is tell people the truth. But we don't want to do that. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 3 that we are to, he says, my son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now, 
Keep the commandments. But you might be thinking, if I keep the commandments, it's going to cost me if I tell the truth. So he says this in verse 5. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And don't lean to your understanding. You see, believer, we think if we tell the boss the truth, we'll be up the creek without a paddle. But Yahweh says, trust me. I think that the real root cause, if you go down to the very bottom of why people lie, is because we don't like Yahweh's sovereign rule over the details of our lives. See, we don't like God's providence for our circumstances, so instead of speaking the truth and trusting Yahweh to take care of us, even when it means being humbled and facing discipline, we lie. We lie. We just don't trust Him. It is true that to our sinful minds, telling a lie is the obvious way out of a problem. It'll save us a job. It'll get us off the hook with the law. Prevent hassle with our teachers, our spouse, whatever. But God's Word tells us differently. He wants us to trust Him and to tell the truth, only the truth, and always the truth. He says, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. And remember the context here from Zechariah. We are dwelling in the new Jerusalem. We are dwelling in the city of truth with the God of truth, and we are called to represent Him by speaking the truth. In position, people, we are righteous as Christ, and in our practice, we are to trust Yahweh to empower us to live up to who we are. Yeshua is truth. We are His followers and are to represent Him honestly, accurately, by being truth-tellers. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. It seems like we've left the realm of teaching and got into meddling. Father, I pray that by Your Spirit You would deal with our hearts, Lord. I think all of us could make some changes to being a little more accurate in our speech to representing truth. Oh Lord, as we reflect on the truth that Paul has taught, help us to remember, Lord, that this quote is pulled from Zechariah because we are dwelling in the new Jerusalem. We're dwelling in the city of truth with a God of truth who asks His children to be an accurate reflection of who He is. Lord, forgive us. So often we do not represent you accurately. You know, it's amazing, Lord, as messed up as we can be. I thank you that your love for us is unconditional. We rest in that, Lord. It gives us courage and strength. But I pray it would also motivate us, Father, to gratitude that we would live in a way that brings glory to you. Amen.